Welcome to Dayspring Fellowship. Whether you are in the room live, watching live online, later on demand, or listening to our podcast, we're thankful that you've taken some time in this busy holiday season to worship with us. I'm Chris Voigt, and I lead the team here at Dayspring. That team is made up of people committed to helping you grow. People grow here because our team loves to challenge, encourage, and equip people to become more like Jesus. If this is your first time visiting Dayspring, we want you to know that this is the kind of church where you get to be you. We're just like you, imperfect people on a journey. We're allowing Jesus to make something beautiful out of our broken and often messy lives. Learning to live like Him. A little more today than yesterday, a little more tomorrow than today. Even if you aren't sure that you're ready to be on that journey with us, maybe you are skeptical about the claims of Jesus or skeptical of His followers. Well. This is still a great place, a safe place to explore and ask questions as you look for answers. We're asking those same questions and looking for answers too. So I think we can be pretty good company on your journey. You can learn more about us as a church by exploring our website at dsf.church, by checking out our Facebook page or contacting us by phone or email. If you need help figuring out the next step to making Dayspring your home church, or if you just have questions, let us know. We'll help you find the answers. For today's service, you can find a discussion guide by selecting Watch from the top menu of our website. And now, let's join our service. Oh man, how many of you have someone in your life that just drives you crazy? Or is, <laughs> or is just difficult to love? Hey, no elbows in the ribs to the person next to you, and no pointing to anyone in the room. Um, how many of you are the difficult person? Yeah, well, we all have blind spots. You know, it's funny how this season can bring out the worst in people. I mean, we've all heard of the Black Friday scenarios where people are basically pushing each other out of the way to make a purchase. Seriously? I mean, I'll be giving this gift out of love only I, after I knock you to the ground to get it. And you know, st statistics show that in the months of November and especially December, there's an increase in anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues. You know, sadly, there's a rise in suicides and suicide attempts during this time. In fact, just this morning, someone lost all hope and they took their own life. Domestic violence is also higher in December than any other time of the year. People are desperate for peace in their hearts and in their minds, and they are desperate for peace with others. Welcome to our series, Missing Peace. And Pastor Chris started us off last week by reminding us that we can only have true peace when our thoughts are focused on Jesus. When we focus our thoughts on Jesus, he becomes bigger, and everything else, the worries of our lives, become smaller. And one study shows that rumination is a big factor in our mental health. Rumination is basically thinking over things over and over and over, pondering the past, pondering the budget, pondering our losses. We miss our loved ones during Christmas season, pondering the things that we wish we could do or buy or escape. And Chris's message last week addressed this very clearly. He, he didn't use the word rumination, but he definitely addressed what we should be ruminating on. Now, when we keep our thoughts on Jesus, it changes our outlook on everything. You know, not that it's wrong to remember and to grieve and hope for our future, but when we're looking at our lives through the lens of Jesus, it changes our outlook. 
It brings peace to the chaos. So if you missed last week, I highly recommend that you watch it. And if you struggle with ruminating thoughts, I highly recommend that you watch it more than once. You know, this week we're talking about finding peace with others, relational peace. God calls us to be at peace with the people in our lives. And also with the people that maybe only cross our path once in, in, in our lives. You know, like the guy that cut you off or the gal at the check stand that's taking way too long for your busy day. Or that person that gaslights you into frustration. And even that person who legitimately hurt you and you haven't fully dealt with that hurt yet. Although this might be an issue all year long, the holidays can exacerbate these situations. And we know that the enemy seeks to kill and steal and destroy anything that is of God, even Christmas cheer. And I find this typical of our enemy. As I told our Bible study last Tuesday, nothing brings Satan more Christmas joy than watching us be distracted by the frustration of the season. And the frustration of the season usually gets directed at people. So before we dive in, let's set our hearts and minds on Christ and the reason for the season. Let's pray before we begin. Heavenly Father, Lord and Savior Jesus, Holy Spirit, the hope of the world the hope of our individual lives for all of eternity. God, may we press into that today. May we press into who you are and who you want us to become. May we hear you personally instead of think of someone else while you're talking to us. God, we came here to be changed by you, so change us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the two commandments from the New Testament are to love God above all else and to love others like Jesus does. That's easy to say, yeah? Difficult to do. And sometimes we want to, but we just don't really know how. I mean, today we're going to look at what Scripture says about what it means and what it takes to have peace in our relationships. So we're going to jump right into Scripture this morning. And as we do, I'm asking you to be open to where God is growing you today. Don't allow your thoughts to be hijacked to how this applies to someone else. How does this apply to you? How does it apply to me? And, and we may hit some very sensitive issues today. Don't let the enemy get the best of you. Keep focused on Jesus and his word. And allow the Holy Spirit to heal and guide you in your relationships. Are you ready? Um, that was not a rhetorical question. Are you ready? All right. Let's take a look at Romans 12. We're going to look at 14 through 18 to start. All right. Bless those who persecute you. There's a good start. Don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Now Paul tells us to bless those who persecute you. And I don't often, if ever, use the word persecution. Um, but what about blessing those who are mean to us? 
who are short with us or those who disagree with us? What about blessing those who hurt us or betray us? What does it mean to bless someone? Now, the word bless literally means to speak well of or to wish the best for someone. Now, think about this. Speak well of and wish the best for someone who's been rude to you or disagrees with you or betrays you or even worse. Now, I think we could all say that it's easy to bless those who are easy to bless. It's much harder and more difficult when pain or disappointment are involved. It's easy to be nice to a nice person or generous to a generous person or loving to a loving person, but when they're a real jerk, it's a little more difficult. Or again, when they've hurt us in a way that seems too painful to get over, it's much harder to speak well of and wish the best for that person. I mean, I'm sure that when that very important person who has that very important place to be at a very important time speeds past you and cuts you off on the freeway and you immediately pray, oh Lord, bless that very important person. Help them to be at peace as they hurry along. Help them get to that very important place that they need to be on time. Yeah, doubtful. It's more likely that when you catch up to them 15 minutes later because their importance is being recognized by flashing blue and red lights, that you rejoice for them. You know, but Paul says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And he says it in the present imperative, which means it's a command that is not a one-time deal, but an ongoing action. It's an ongoing action as in every day, forever. Keep blessing and continue to refrain from cursing. Uh, Craig Groeschel says it this way, be a continual blessing to those who are a continual problem. Now, I don't know about you, but I can be a blessing for a while until I'm not. I, I just can't keep it up when I'm pressed. I, I can't do this on my own strength, and neither can you. It's only because of God's mercy and grace and power of the Holy Spirit inside all of us as we have a relationship with Jesus that we can bless it all, let alone when it's difficult. And when I think of what God has done for me, his mercy to my undeserved attitudes and behavior, his grace and forgiveness for my ongoing offenses, his unconditional love even when I offend him and his people, when my thoughts are on how God loves me in spite of myself, it helps me to love others in spite of myself. My love for others should not be conditional on their behavior or their attitude. And we'll get back to that one. So don't just, don't what if me just yet. My love for others is conditional on my behavior and attitude. When I mentally and emotionally connect with the Holy Spirit and allow his love to flow through me, only then can I lay down the offense and get over the irritation, forgive the hurt. And how I love others is what brings peace in my relationships. Now, I see your minds working. I promise we'll get to the what ifs before we're done today. Now, in verse 16, Paul says to live in harmony with one another. And verse 16, he says, live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think that you know it all. It's a great verse for those of us who are just waiting to be offended. For those of you who are constantly on the edge of your seat, just waiting for someone to offend you again over the past issues or over the current situation or over tomorrow's predicted outcome over politics or the parking spot at the mall or church. 
Paul says to live in harmony. Overlook the offense. Choose not to be offended. Now, it sounds easy, yeah? But it's very difficult for someone who's in that rut. It takes focusing on Jesus and humility and maybe even an accountability partner who will call you out on it. And we can't control other people's words and actions, but we can control how we respond. And here's the thing. People will hurt us and disappoint us and lie to us and offend us somehow. And as I said, we have to choose how to navigate that. When we are looking to be hurt or insulted or offended, we will most likely find what we're looking for. Looking to be offended is a lose-lose situation. No one ever said that walking around with a chip on their shoulder enhanced their life. And no one ever said they are, they are so glad that they're so easily offended because it makes them so much happier and so much more productive. You know, I wonder how much time is lost spent on ruminating on the negative about someone or something. Check yourself to see if you have a critical spirit and are regularly the one that is offending others. I mean, what types of comments are we making? What are the norm for us? Are they critical or passive aggressive toward another? And if they are, we're not creating harmony. We're creating tension. So what do we need to do differently to live in harmony? If you don't know, ask your family and friends and pray that they will be healthy enough to tell you the truth in love. And that the truth is received with love. A critical spirit often has its root in pride. You know, someone with a critical spirit can always identify how a person could do better or at the very least is quick to point out the fault or the low quality of or the mistakes of others. A critical spirit does not create harmony. And even if it isn't directed toward me, I just don't enjoy being around someone who's always criticizing someone or something. You know, pride causes people to think that they're better than or above someone else. I have a better education. I know more about the subject. I have more experience. I'm in a higher position. And pride also causes people to think that they know it all. I mean, I have to say, there are more people that think they know everything because they read it on the internet or they saw it on the news than ever before. They think because of said knowledge that they are better than or smarter than or righter than someone else. They're all that and a bag of chips, for those of you who remember the 90s. You know, since COVID, there is more polarization than ever before on just about any subject you choose. And if we disagree, all of a sudden there's this tension and then it gets weird. You know, the right fighting is at an all-time high. You know, right fighting is when we care more about being right than we care about the relationship. People can't have a real debate on any given subject without emotions getting hot or at least stirred up. And I don't understand what happened. I mean, personally, I love debating any subject. Just having a conversation with someone who has a differing opinion to broaden my emotional intellect And it helps me to understand another person and what makes them tick. Not everyone likes debates. It feels like conflict, and most people don't like conflict. I'm not afraid of that either, by the way. (laughs) Clearly. (laughs) As long as it is healthy, God-honoring conflict. In fact, working through conflict is one of those things that when done in a way that honors God, grows us spiritually. You know, Pastor John is really good about bringing a differing opinion to a conversation just to make sure that all the bases are covered. And I so appreciate that gift on our team because it helps us to remember that people think differently. 
And if we're not willing to listen to differing perspectives, our influence and our impact will be limited. Listening to different perspectives is not a threat to the truth of God's word. And we should not be afraid to hear what someone else thinks. You know, part of living at peace with others is being a good listener. Are we humble listeners? Do we listen to understand and love not to correct or to respond? Do we start with grace and then move to truth? Don't be too quick to point out the truth before you extend grace. You catch more flies with grace first. And the truth is that the world isn't going to recognize the body of Christ because they were right. They will recognize the body of Christ because they love like Jesus. Now, verse 17 says, never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you are honorable. Now, the word petty comes to mind. I can be petty. Thankfully, it's usually contained inside my head. It's kind of like that secret pleasure that we all get when that guy gets what's coming to him. And don't you act like you don't know what I mean. (laughs) You know, I would say in general that Christ followers wouldn't consider that they do anything evil towards someone else. I mean, we view evil deeds as those that are, you know, committed by an axe murderer or other offenses that would land someone in jail for a long, long time, or at least they should. But I challenge you to think of evil as anything that pleases the enemy. Does it please the enemy when we harbor ill will toward another? Does it please the enemy when we choose to treat someone else in a way that contradicts God's way? You know, when we practice a lifestyle of honesty and fairness and integrity and our beliefs and Christian value, it shows in our actions and how we treat other people. That's what an honorable life looks like. And the challenge is that we easily say what we believe But then our actions don't always align with what we say we believe. So which is true? What we believe or what we live? Now, don't think that we're getting out early just because we've arrived at verse 18. This verse is definitely the most difficult to live out. And that's why we're going to camp here for just a little bit. Do all that you can to live at peace Live in peace with everyone. Do all that I can. What does that look like in real life? You know, when we offend someone else, we look at our intent. And then we defend ourselves. Well, that's not what I meant. But when we look at someone else's offense, we judge them by their actions. And we forget that their intent may have been pure and they were tired or sad or stressed or hurting. When we are offended, we tend to fill in that gap with a story about their intent. The enemy always wants to help us out here. The enemy wants our stories about another's intentions to be accusatory. Satan is, after all, the accuser. And we begin to think negative thoughts about the one who offended us. Accusations erode relationships, which is exactly what he's looking for. But God wants our relationships and our stories to be rooted in love. God wants us to think the best first about others. Think the best first and don't let the enemy take your thoughts into a negative direction. And when in doubt, for crying out loud, clarify. I mean, allow Jesus to work in the relationship and clarify what you're thinking. For example, you know, you were pretty short with me yesterday. Are we okay? Are you upset about something? Don't be a relationship weakling. 
Be brave and be prayerful and go after it. I mean, do what God would want you to do to clarify and to show love. And if it's not that big a deal for you, truly, then just let it go. Choose not to take up the offense. Relationships are so much easier and more fun when we don't have to second guess everything. You know, living at peace requires a shift in our thinking and a decision, a decision to love like Jesus. It requires humility and gentleness and patience. Ephesians 4.2 says, always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. We make allowances because of our love, which is made possible because he first loved us. We make allowances because of what God has done for us. We make allowances because Jesus said, I'll be the sacrifice. I'll suffer grievous offenses and pain, both physical and emotional, so that I can show you what love truly looks like. I mean, what if Jesus were as easily as offended as we are? You know, I, just, I gave the Sermon on the Mount and those yahoos weren't even paying attention. I just healed the sick and blind and they don't even believe me. What a bunch of losers. You know, his example of overlooking offenses is our example. I mean, what if he didn't overlook my offenses? What if Jesus didn't overlook my faults? That would put me on a fast track to hell. And I think I need to be better at overlooking small offenses and not filling in the story with the accuser's ending, but filling in the story with the love of Christ and his ending. Now, overlooking an offense isn't pretending that it didn't happen. It's making a conscious choice to let it go. It's forgiving in real time. It shows wisdom in choosing relationship over being right or harboring hurt feelings. Proverbs 9.11 says this, A person's wisdom yields patience. It's to one's glory to overlook an offense. Now the word overlook or avor in Hebrew means to pass over. It means to get up and above. Pass over the offense. Don't get dragged down into the offense. Okay, Michelle, I get it. Overlook smaller offenses, but what about those more difficult situations? Well, here's where the what-ifs come in. What if the offense makes it unsafe for me or my family? What if the offense is a recurring toxic situation as in addictive behavior or narcissism? That's much more complex and much more complicated. Even so... It still requires forgiveness on our part. Now, forgiveness and overlooking are actually quite similar. Forgiveness means that I will give it over to God and allow him to handle the outcome and the pain. I will pass it over to God, and I will no longer harbor the negative emotions about the individual. I will truly pray God's best for that person. Now we're still overlooking because we're choosing to live above the hurt and allowing God to handle it. And it sometimes takes a lot of time and hard work to get to this place in particularly traumatizing circumstances. If you need help, we can help you find it. Please do not go one more day if you are stuck because of something like this. You can let us know in the prayer section of the communication card, or you can email Chris or myself, or you can catch us in the lobby after the service. Forgiveness is letting go of the consequences for the other person and leaving it up to the Lord. And with that said... Forgiveness is not excusing the action. It's not saying that the action was okay. 
and it is not acting as if nothing happened. Forgiveness frees our heart, your heart, my heart, and our minds from the situation. It gives us peace because we know that the one that we can trust will handle the outcome. For forgiveness doesn't mean that we have to be best friends or close relatives or do lunch or whatever. Sometimes forgiveness and loving well needs to be from a distance. We can love someone and desire and pray God's best for someone without being in close proximity to them. Although forgiveness and restoration are different, they are often confused for the same thing. Now, I can forgive you and still not have restoration in our relationship. I can be ready to have relationship restored, but maybe I need to wait until you're ready. Maybe the other person uh, needs to be healthy or safe or willing to restore relationship before it can happen. This is where patience comes in. We can't allow time passing to diminish the importance of restoration whenever it is possible. Now, let me give you an example. Let's say that an abuser isn't ready to get help and learn how to control their anger and impulses. Should I forgive them for their actions? Yes. Do I have to subject myself or my family to danger? No. Restoration requires change. Or let's say my family member is an addict. You pick the addiction. Uh, their addiction is hurting me and it's offending the trust in our relationship. It, it could even be dangerous to me or my family. Should I forgive? Yes. Is it appropriate to set boundaries in the relationship until they get some significant recovery time under their belt? Yes. Restoration requires change. Restoration takes two but forgiveness only requires one. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Sometimes it doesn't depend on us. We can do all the right things with all the right attitudes, and the other half of the equation just hasn't done the work. Yet. We must always be prepared and ready for restoration because God is always working in the lives of people. And God, oh, it is just amazing what he can do in the lives of people. I mean, look at Paul. He was a murdering religious zealot, and look how God restored him. I mean, look how many people do choose to get help that they need to overcome addiction or betrayal or anger, or you name it, and they are successful. Don't ever write someone off of God's list. Continue to desire and pray for God's best in their lives. That's our part until they're ready to do their part. Unfortunately, sometimes the restoration does not happen this side of heaven. But as far as we are concerned, we must live at peace as long as it is up to us. And let's face it, sometimes we are the reason that the restoration is not happening. We just can't get there. We just can't forgive. We choose to stay mad or stuck or angry or hurt, and we choose not to give it up to the Lord. You know, I can relate to this on a smaller scale. When Tony and I are having a constructive discussion, that's pastor language for intense argument. <laughs> and we get things worked out and he's all ready to be fine. His ADD's moved him on and he's that and he is a forgiveness machine, which is also annoying. <laughs> because, well, sometimes I am not quite ready yet. I'm not ready to let go of the mad. I kind of want to sit in this anger for a few more minutes before I let you off the hook. Obviously an emotionally healthy choice. <laughs> and obviously I will not be at peace until I move on also. The bottom line is that 
we cannot experience true peace until we experience peace with others. We cannot have peace with Jesus if we are cultivating conflict with others. In fact, receiving communion, when we receive communion, the Bible says that if we have conflict with another person, we should go and reconcile first. That's how seriously God takes our relationships. As far as it is up to us, be at peace with others. Now, here are some things to, for us to consider on our journey to healthy, loving relationships. We've, we must embrace becoming considerate. This means that we consider others' feelings and thoughts and existence valuable, even when we disagree. We must embrace patience and the fact that we are not the only ones on the planet. We must embrace sympathy and empathy and learn how to respect people even when they are doing things differently or thinking differently or acting differently than we want them to. After all, we are probably doing or thinking or acting differently than someone wants us to. We are so good at justifying our approach to relationships that they're that are in conflict or justifying our negative thoughts and comments toward another person because we love something else more than we love them. We love ourselves more than we love them. Now, I want to be that person who walks in a room and brings peace and love and patience to my surroundings. I mean, I want people to want to, want to be around me. I mean, not because I'm all that. I mean... but because he is all that, and I have him. We're called to be living sacrifices, and that means that we are to live our lives willing to give up our own way. It's like giving a gift. I will give you the gift of overlooking what drives me nuts about you. And I hope that you will do the same for me. Some of us are walking around just waiting to be offended. And just for the record, that's usually all year long. You can't blame that one on the holidays. Quick to judge, quick to become angry, quick to block anyone who has offended them. If you're living in a state of discontentment with everything and everyone around you, the common denominator is you. The two commandments from the New Testament are love God above all else and love others like Jesus does. Easy to say, difficult to do. Sometimes we want to, but we just don't know how. Pray for God's strength and guidance. Be brave. Don't be relationally lazy. Get in there and work at those relationships. Learn to forgive and learn healthy boundaries. And remember that, a, that being offended is inevitable. Living offended is a choice. Now, I want to close by slowly reading a very familiar passage to you. We're not in a huge rush, so we have some time. And I want you to really think about these verses and how they apply to your heart. Keep focused on Jesus and don't let the enemy distract you from what God has for you. It'll be up on the screens for those of you who need a visual. And some of you may wish to just close your eyes and just take it in. You do whatever works best for you and I won't be offended. First Corinthians, First Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Clearly loving others is the most important thing. And as we read this next section, I want you to consider the areas that maybe you need to grow in. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy or boast. It is not proud. 
It does not dishonor others. And it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. How are we doing in the love department? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gracious love and the opportunity to choose you above all else. And we acknowledge, God, that, that in relationship with you is the only way that we can love like you love. And in every single one of us, there's a struggle. Point it out. Show us where our next little spot of growth is in the love department. God, help us to be considerate and caring and loving. God, this time of year, can be difficult and the fact that we're celebrating the birth of the one who saved us for so many doesn't take away the, the sadness and the difficulty of the season so God I just pray a special blessing on those hearts who are hurting and those minds who are away from you they would rejoice in the gift of your salvation. Feel the presence of your love in the difficult challenges. Have the ability to forgive and set healthy boundaries that honor you. We love you, Lord, and we know you love us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Let me encourage you to download the discussion guide by selecting Watch from the top menu of our website. Working through those questions on your own or with others will help the truth of God's Word begin to shape your life as you grow to be like Jesus. Please reach out if you have any questions or want help on your spiritual journey. My email address is on the screen or you can call the church during the week. If you are just checking us out today, please know that we don't expect you to give anything to support Dayspring. We count it a privilege to play a small part in God's perfect work in you today. The people who call Dayspring their home church make this ministry possible. Their faithful giving is proof of God's work in their lives and they wanna pay it forward so you can experience the same life-changing presence of Jesus. For those of you who would like to start giving, we have three easy ways for you to get us your gift. Please see the online giving section of our website or text GIVE to the number on your screen or mail a check to us at the address you'll find on our website. Until we meet again, I am praying that God will give you opportunities to use your influence for the glory of His kingdom. And one more thing. Thank you for liking and sharing and following Dayspring on whatever platform you connect with us. Thank you for rating us where that is appropriate. Even more, thank you for sharing our services with your friends and family. If this service was a blessing to you, it'll probably be a blessing to someone else too. God uses you to plant seeds in other people's lives, so keep sowing.